please consent. <laughs> and without further ado, um, welcome to day four um, of our virtual Asian retreat. It has been a journey and thank you for journeying with us as we attempt to, you know, recreate our retreat virtually um, this, this fall. Um, so I'm Dean Juliana Yi, as I've already met most of you, um, and I'm excited um, to kind of walk you through a little bit of Asian American history with Min. I don't know, Min, if you want to like give a brief introduction or anything, we can jump right into the preface as well. Sure, I'm Min. I'm one of the GAs at the ACC. Uh, it's been really great to be in community with all of you these past like three or four days, so I'm really excited to jump into this. Um, so yeah, basically this session, Dini and I are going to give a mini crash course on Asian American history. Um, we wanted to give, you know, at the beginning some sort of content warning or a content forecast that, you know, this presentation will be discussing anti-Asian racism through visual and historical examples. So if you need to step out for a bit, that's totally fine and you should feel free to do so in that um, we're always here to talk, whether after the presentation or in the chat. Um, so as you all know, the guiding theme of this retreat has been solidarity. So that's why we've you know, had so many workshops and exercises that get at that theme. So whether from the first day in identifying common points of connection between us to uh, a discussion of anti-Asian racism um, at the end of the night, or the second day with our journey maps, or the third day with the diversity wall, privilege identity workshop, or inventory of racialized experiences, and the documentary, um, all of these activities sort of were made to prompt self-reflection on our own subject positions, but also like how they relate in the larger context of the various communities that we all inhabit. Um, so the Asian retreat organizers just want to thank you all for being so open and being willing to sit in moments of discomfort uh, and to, you know, engage collectively in these discussions. Um, and then the next, the next sort of like preface or disclaimer that I'll say is that this history that Dean Yi and I have presented here, like all histories, um, is incomplete and you know is just one version of the story we obviously you know could not include everything so as Dini and I uh, talk about histories of inclusion and exclusion in Asian American history we should also think about like the materials that we've given here um, also exclude some materials that we could have included um, so that's all to say that like this isn't a presentation like to you all but rather just like an ignition of a conversation that we all can have so um, we all come from different like academic and personal experiences. So as we move throughout this session, please feel free to bring in your own research, your own historical examples, and also your lived experiences, which are just as much a part of the history. Um, oh, yeah. do you want to say something for the preface? Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, you're good. I think, um, you know, similar to what Min was saying, I think we're all lifelong learners and, you know, given how, U.S. history has been taught, I think we often have to do a lot of our own work um, to really learn anything about our histories in the U.S. context, in the global context. Um, and so we hope that this will, you know, either present you some new information or same information, but a new way of thinking about it. Um, and by no means is it comprehensive. And, you know, we're excited to learn, learn along with you. Um, so I think, you know, it's it's always important to start with the fact that, you know, the history of Asian Americans is, is really, really also an, a history of immigration, right? Um, it's a history of how race has worked in the United States. Um, and that is a direct quote from Erica Lee's book, um, The Making of Asia America, which I highly recommend anyone pick up if they're really curious. Um, I know I learned a lot from that text. Uh, but broadly speaking, right, we always get this idea of like, who is Asian American, who gets to be counted, or who gets to be included. Um, so broadly speaking, Asian Americans are people who can trace their roots to, to countries throughout East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. Um, <clears throat> and I think often obscured by the broad definition of Asian, right, and Asian American, it's just the staggering diversity of peoples that are represented within kind of these umbrella terms. And you know, being based in the U.S. right now, um, and often thinking about Asian American history as ha as just you know very much based in the U.S. context, I think I want to also remind us that Asian history, right, is just a series of movements, as 
um, kind of shown in this diagram, this GIF um, of all these movements of, of people from across the entire world driven by numerous factors, right? Whether that's like war or, you know, just new opportunities or just displacement by natural disasters. Um, the Asian diaspora is, is not just a movement from Asia. In fact, it's, it's global, right? Which is why um, when we think about who encapsulates the Asian and Asian American community at Yale, it's, it's, we really want to say the Asian diaspora because they don't necessarily come from Asia only. Um, <clears throat> and also to just think about um, the push-pull idea is really the dominant way in which immigration to America is framed. But that really is just part of the story, right? Um, and Asian immigration has been particularly tied to the U.S. presence in Asia, specifically with colonial and military occupations in the Philippines, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia. Those military occupations and presence have actually brought a lot of Asians to the U.S. as colonial subjects, military brides, um, transracial adoptees, refugees, right, the list goes on. And so to really think about how U.S.-Asian international relations continue to present day really affects the ways in which Asian immigration patterns and the treatment of Asian Americans in the U.S., you know, with COVID-19 being kind of the most current um, example of that. And so next slide, um, as we kind of think about the who was, were the first and earliest arrivals of Asia, Asians in the U.S. Uh, we, I kind of wanted to bring kind of these two examples of um, forces that brought Asians, um, you know, juxtaposing more broadly the U.S., but also Yale University, which is the institution that, we, that has brought us all together in the first place. Um, and so recognizing that European colonization on both sides of the Pacific Ocean actually led to the first migrations of Asian to the Americas. So the photo that you will see is um, kind of a, a drawing or an artist rendition of the Manila Galleon, which also is often dubbed as castles in the sea because they were these massive ships that would bring just like hundreds of people and all these goods um, that were being traded back and forth. Um, and about, it, it is, kind of estimated that about 40,000 to 100,000 Asians from China, Japan, the Philippines, and South and Southeast Asia crossed the Pacific from Manila and landed in Acapulco um, during the 250-year history of galleon trade. Um, and so it's estimated that in the first Filipino or the first Asian identifying people to ever step foot in, on U.S. soil uh, was in 1587 um, when Filipino crew members were likely, again, because of how long ago this was, it's a guess, um, but Filipino crew members were likely on a Manila galleon that made a brief stop, stop in Morro Bay, and they actually had battles with the locals before heading back out to sea. Um, and then Filipinos were also among the first settlers in Alta California after it became a province and territory of the new Spain in 1769. So just acknowledging the fact that colonial trade and labor were major driving forces in you know, Asian, ident Asian identifying people's presence in, in the Americas. <clears throat> and then I'm sure some of you recognize the portrait of this gentleman um, named Yang Wing. We have it in the AACC living room as well. The reason why is because Yang Wing is actually the first Asian identifying person to ever graduate from a university in the North Americas um, in 1854. And, you know, I think as I, as I would think about Yang Wing's uh, name and his legacy and why he's uplifted, it also led me to think about, so how did Yang Wing come to be, like what led him, what allowed him to come to the U.S. Um, at a time, you know, before um, the Chinese Exclusion Act, which um, we'll talk about shortly. And it, it really turns out that it was because uh, an individual named Samuel Robbins Brown, who is a Yale educated missionary, um, actually went to Guangdong to and was really impressed by Yang Wing and several other um, individuals 
and decided to bring them to the United States um, for preparatory school and then eventually set, sent them to Yale in 1850, um, which is what led Yang Wing to be able to kind of, um, you know, get that degree and, and then build a life for himself. Um, and he eventually ended up, you know, um, passing away in Hartford. But I think it really, for me, that that moment of discovery, like, oh, wow, like a Yale educated missionary all the way in China, like, what are they doing out there in China? And it really reminds me of who Yale was created for, right? And that Yale was really created as, as an institution for white missionaries um, to spread the gospel and education was really seen as the tool um, to spread the gospel across um, the United States and across the world. And that theme will come up again um, as we are going through the rest of kind of our crash course. Yeah, so we are, um, we're gonna move on to discussions of exclusion. Um, so we wanted to open it up to the group just to make the session a bit more interactive rather than you know one person saying something to the group. So I guess, um, you know, what are some observations that you all see in the photo? And there's no need to like, be like correct about it. Like you can just list your immediate like reactions or opinions or observations that you see from this. And feel free to just jump in um, and unmute. We can't see everyone, so just unmute and go for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess uh, one word that comes to mind uh, right away is uh, humiliation. There's a very like dehumanizing caricature of the clearly like Asian American folks in this photo, East Asian American. And I don't know, they look almost like rat-like, the long like skinny nails, the tails as like the, the hair. Yeah, those are great observations. And then there's a, a couple more photos if anyone wants to throw some more observations here. Also feel free to kind of name what feelings um, these images evoke for you. I'm a little confused about the one on the right. Um, just like the portrayal is like, makes me feel weird, but also the fact that it's titled The Wasp. Yeah, I agree. I'm also confused by the one on the right. It's also interesting, like the one on the left, like how history is kind of repeating itself for now. And like the wall has just been a term that's been used consistently throughout history to like, uh, I don't know, like, again, like just uphold like whiteness. <laughs> yeah, so um, those are really great observations that I think point to like the anti-Asian logics that circulated throughout the period. Um, and the photographs that you've just analyzed come from an era otherwise known as the exclusion era for Asians and Asian Americans um, since earliest 19th century to mid 20th century. Um, you know, of course, anti-Asian exclusion still happens today, but we just wanted to highlight, you know, a sort of hot spot in history um, of exclusion. So basically the, the period of exclusion brought a whole host of laws that prohibited Asian inclusion into the national fold. Um, the sort of like undergirding logic to all of the exclusion was yellow peril, which understood Asian people as pathologies or infections to, to the United States, you know, who would either dirty society or like suck all of its resources. Um, and this language of peril, you know, was present in like what many of you were saying about the photos, such as through the representation of Chinese immigrants as rodents um, and like, um, yeah, it's like dirty creatures, basically. And in terms of these laws that you see here, I won't go through each of them um, extensively, um, except for the two bolded ones. But, um, 
you know, the, the first law, the anti uh, Cooley Act, imposed a monthly tax on Chinese immigrants, you know, who were doing business in California. Um, and this law was created to appease white laborers who thought that Chinese people were taking jobs and wages from them. Um, the Page Act in 19, 1875 prohibited the entry of um, Chinese women into the United States, you know, who the, who the U.S. government considered, uh, quote, undesirable, since they would allegedly engage in prostitution and therefore corrupt the purity of, like, white Christian America. Um, and thus there's a sort of, like, through this law, a sort of gendered dimension um, of law that we should always consider. And then for the next law, which is, I think, what we all kind of know, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, is kind of heralded as like the key law that prohibited all and any Chinese immigration. Um, as for the two bolded laws, I'll discuss them right after this slide. But the, the last two that you see, the Executive Order and Korematsu versus the United States, those sort of authorized the incarceration of Japanese and Japanese American residents during World War II, um, when the US was suspicious of those um, from the Japanese diaspora because of the geopolitics of them being against Japan during the war. Um, and what Dean Yi and I wanted to sort of highlight with this slide and juxtaposition with like the photographs that you saw was that the laws that you see here are not separate from like the cultural productions and graphics that we presented earlier. Um, like it's also not the case that like one happened before or after the other in lockstep, but rather happened at the same time. So, you know, as the U.S. was creating these racist laws or anti-Asian laws, these publications or these art artists were also creating these illustrations at the same time. And, you know, as these racist illustrations were being distributed all across America, you know, occupying our cultural mainstream consciousness, racist laws were being created to codify and, like, reinforce these very um, anti-Asian sentiments. Um, a really easy way to make this concrete is to think a lot about how there's a lot of anti-Asian sentiment going on now, with COVID being distributed all across social media uh, and the news, while at the same time, the Trump administration, you know, has been banning trade and travel transactions with China. Um, so, you know, across history, we see how both law and culture are interwoven and happen at the same time. Um, and then for this slide, there's a lot of text, apologies. <laughs> um, we wanted to highlight, you know, these two cases that are normally discussed in tandem. Um, and we just wanted to showcase the, you know, the extreme extent to which the United States rationalizes Asian exclusion. Um, so on the left, there's a sort of timeline here. On the left, you, there's the Naturalization Act in 1906, which stipulates that only free white persons and persons of African uh, nativity or persons of African descent can naturalize in the United States and sort of garner more rights. So in 1922, there was a man by the name of Takao Ozawa who argued that he, you know, he should have the right to naturalize because he was a free white person. Um, and then he made two main arguments for that. And one was because his skin was lighter than the average white person's. And two, because he had culturally assimilated into uh, American culture through his, quote, honesty and industriousness. But the, the Supreme Court argued that, you know, he was not eligible for naturalization because although he had culturally assimilated into the U.S., he was not of the, the, the Caucasian race. Um, so here the court uses the logics of science um, rather than like a social construction of race. But then in 1923, um, there was a man by uh, the name of Bhagat Singh Thind who argued that he was a free white person and he was building off the Ozawa case and he says, you know, I'm technically Caucasian because he identified as an Aryan. But then the court argued that he was not eligible for naturalization as a free white person because he wasn't white in the common eyes, in the eyes of the common man. Um, so here there's a sort of social definition of race rather than the scientific definition of race. So here we see how like the 1922 and the 1923 cases, you know, are in like direct like antagonism and like contra in contradiction with each other. And that's because the US, you know, will, will always bend its law or like bend its policies in order to sort of support its agenda. And in this case, the agenda is um, anti-Asian exclusion. And then this next part will be going into inclusion. Um, sorry, Min. Le Peter actually had a question about the oh, origins of using Caucasian to refer to white people. Um, that's a good question that I'm not fully sure of. Also, I misspelled Caucasian <laughs> just to <laughs> identify that for you. Um, what was the reason? So I think the, the, for the court, the use of um, Caucasian 
was to create a scientific definition of race that says like white people come from like a certain origin. And that was the logic that was used to um, exclude Ozawa because Ozawa was saying, oh, I'm white because like I, I, I've incorporated into the American mainstream. But then the court was like, no, but you're not of the Caucasian race. Like you're not from the certain geographic area. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's, the, that's the origin of Caucasian in terms of this court case. Right, and I think it, and we can share resources, you know, that's like a whole course in and of itself, <laughs> um, but we can definitely share resources about how that, that initial logic of who gets to be white being from the caucus clearly is not one that has stood the test of time, right? The definition or the category, categorization of who gets to be white has changed over the course of US history. Um, so I think that just looking at that in and of itself turns the logic on its head, right? That only certain people can be white, but that's not something, unfortunately, people had to kind of argue with back in the day. Uh, but I think the, the course of history is, is always <laughs> the, the best teacher there um, in, in turning illogical things on its head. Um, but <clears throat> I think we want to frame the next section as like inclusion-ish. Um, recognizing that, you know, while over the course of history, there have certainly been a lot of movements, right, um, and laws, whether that's legal, legal changes in laws, or just like moments in our history um, that have been fought for by um, Asian, our Asian American communities um, to, to push for further inclusion, it's not always such a binary thing. Um, and so this photo, I don't know if any of you have ever seen this photo before or, you know, in a course or something that you've taken or ever heard about the Golden Spike Ceremony. Um, but this ceremony is one um, essentially picturing um, all these individuals, white men, um, who were quote unquote involved in building this um, transnational railroad um, that was a huge deal right back in the day because the only thing that would connect people initially was roads. Um, but with this railroad, it essentially cut down the transportation of goods, right? It all came down to economic um, kind of profiting. Um, it allowed the journey of goods to be cut down from weeks to days. Um, and that was massive. And so this photo is essentially where the two tracks would meet from both the West and the East Coast. And so it's called the Golden Spike because they literally had a, like a, I don't know, 24 karat gold spike to kind of um, join the two railroads from both sides. And so this photo is essentially erases um, all the labor of Chinese individuals um, that were involved in building the railroads. Um, they were completely excluded from it, um, no surprise. And then so 150 years later, um, I mean, you can click. Um, it was a big kind of victory for the Chinese American community where they were, they made a pilgrimage. Um, some of them are actually ancestors of the Chinese laborers who built the railroads. Um, and they gathered for this photo and reenactment essentially of the scene where they were like, well, we will not be erased any longer. Um, here we are 150 years now with, you know, multi-generations um, and we will now be the center of this photo. Um, and it was a big moment, right? It was a big moment of victory, um, of saying, you know, like, regardless of, of erasure and, and how much we have been kind of exploited for our labor, um, here we are, you know, 150 years later. And it was certainly a powerful moment, but also, <clears throat> Something that perhaps, you know, is, is um, something for our community to still reckon with is what does it mean for the Native American communities, um, many of whom were actually removed from their lands um, in order for this railroad to be built. Um, there were 15 different tribal nations um, who were involved in, in kind of a land dispute with the U.S. Um, because of the transcontinental railroad that was being built th through their lands. Um, and then also, what did it mean for, you know, the state, like the steady migration of settlers, right, um, who not only did the construction of the railroad devastate the people of the Central Plains, but the overhunting of bison and the loss of land that impacted Native livelihood, what part did we take in that, right, as settler immigrants, um, and I think that's still something 
uh, a part of our history that remains to be contended with. Yeah, and then we wanted to open up the floor again to anyone's you know, observations on these two photos that you see here. Um, so on the left is a Time magazine cover, and then on the right is um, a story written in the New York Times magazine. Uh, feel free to, yeah, just put your observations in the chat if you want. But just, yeah, to give you some context, I think um, this era of inclusion also saw the formation of the term model minority. Um, and that, that story you see on the right was actually the origin of the term, which was in 1966 by the sociologist William Peterson, who talks about um, how Japanese Americans and uh, Japanese people recovered from like internment and like created like livelihoods for themselves and like got good education um, and therefore even um, I think the the passage that I put there like talks about how Japanese Americans surpassed um, even like white people of the United States so that was the that was actually the first recording of the term model minority um, and then the left is a sort of 1980s reproduction of the term and we see you know the the focus on like intelligence um, and discussing like whiz kids, for example, and like some weird stereotyping through like the use of books and like technology to sort of frame, you know, Asian children as robots of education and, and as, mo as models. Um, so yeah, as we enter the 20th century, this period was sort of marked by Asian inclusion um, for a lot of reasons that we'll go into um, primarily related to war and also at, you know, at the expense of black, brown and native communities in the US as Jimmy has mentioned. Um, so the, the Philippine American War resulted in the US occupation of the Philippines. So we see like a literal inclusion um, through like the acquisition of territory. And this, this process of like war as a form of incorporation um, is also present in World War II uh, when the U.S. was against Japan and was in desire of acquiring the Pacific Islands and also Southeast Asia. Um, the, the Magnuson Act slowly allowed Chinese immigrants to come and allowed for some Chinese immigrants in the U.S. to have citizen, citizenship rights. Um, and, you know, and the reason for that wasn't just out of like benevolence or like a, a recognition of wrongdoing during Chinese exclusion, but it was also, it's important to consider like out of strategy by the US government too. Like there's no coincidence that like the Magnuson Act and World War II, the dates are so close to each other. Um, you know, and the US started, began to be kinder to Chinese immigrants because China was one of its allies during World War II as the US was against Japan. So we, we sort of see how there's a sort of specific calculus, a social and political calculus that's being conducted by the government. Um, and then eventually the US passed a couple of immigration acts in order to allow for more immigrants to come. And this is when the US wanted to have a larger international presence, especially during the Cold War when the government was scared of the spread of communism, meaning that the government you know, started bringing in people from communist countries in order to stop the spread um, of, of that political order and in, in desire of projecting a vision of liberal democracy as like the, the sort of internationalist vision. Um, and then these immigration acts were further reinforced um, through the Refugee Act, which allowed for more, more migrants to come to the US, but with the exception of limited rights since refugees weren't fully citizens or fully incorporable. Um, the Amerasian Homecoming Act allowed for multiracial racial children in the US um, no, multiracial children in Vietnam who were born to U.S. fathers um, to come to America. And this was after um, the Vietnam War. And then the, the Civil Liberties Acts provided reparations to Japanese and Japanese Americans to sort of um, make up for uh, internment and incarceration. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, as Asians were becoming more and more included within the U.S. fold, that this was in relation to other people of color as well who were being compared to, to the model minority in terms of assimilation and status in the US. So as the government lauded Asians and Asian Americans for having you know, a good education, for making money, and for like sort of overcoming like histories of exclusion to become 
you know, uh, successful in, in, um, in the United States, that the government was simultaneously still in settler colonial processes of taking land from indigenous people, um, trying to cast doubt on the civil rights movement um, that's being, that was being led by black Americans. So the US would basically ask something along the lines of like, you know, it doesn't make sense that black communities are asking for equal, white, equal rights because it's, there's already equality. Like look at Asians who are making the same who are making the same or even exceeding white people. Um, so uh, even though there are people of color, so we, there, there were sort of direct, uh, direct comparisons between uh, uh, minority groups. Um, and I think that's all to say that, you know, inclusion is a very complicated topic fueled by so many different intentions and incentives. On one hand, inclusion was a very beneficial thing that allowed for Asians to garner rights and have legibility within a society that initially excluded them from, you know, for the past century. But on the other hand, inclusion in the, in the hands of the government um, has been weaponized um, at the expense of, you know, other Asians, um, as well as Black, Brown, and Native communities. And then, you know, Dini and I, in unraveling all of these dynamics, you know, don't want to posit a certain thesis that like inclusion is bad or inclusion is good, but to present you all of like the different logics and possibilities that are always contradictory, um, just for us to consider as we, you know, continue to learn more about history and continue to live it as well. Um, that everything is a very mixed bag and that there's no single answer. Yeah, and I think with that, um, I think it's also important to think about, um, you know, us ourselves as like, and through time, right, we are also active actors. We are also making active decisions um, at the same time, making it within a particular context that we do or do not have control over. Um, so I think it's just important to, to not always like think of, you know, particular groups of people as like victims with completely no agency. I think it's often more of a mix, right, um, rather than a, a a tough binary, a hard binary. Um, and so, you know, an example of kind of like a little murky example um, of inclusion is, is one of, you know, Filipino Americans um, in the nursing industry. And um, what are your y'all's thoughts on kind of these two images? Um, one is an ad um, in kind of published in 19 in the 1969 issue of the Philippine Journal of Nursing recruiting um, essentially individuals to apply very specifically to a hospital job in Chicago Illinois and you know the wages that are advertised in US dollars um, and just kind of all the benefits and then also the image on the right is one of a headline article that was just published a couple of days ago. What are your y'all's thoughts on this? Any initial reactions um, in thinking about, I know I've definitely thought about like, wow, I know a lot of Filipino Americans who are nurses um, and how did, how did that come to be? Go for it, Peter. Yeah, I think, one thought um, that I have when I, what, what really comes to mind when I think of, um, you know, like the heavy advertising that the Americans um, did to bring um, Filipino nurses over here was that I think it, it must have inevitably created a, a brain drain um, in which you drew the talent away um, from the Philippines to the U.S. So I guess, you know, obviously that would mean that rather than um, talented healthcare professionals staying in the Philippines to develop um, the infrastructure over there, they would come, I guess, you know, here to the U.S. to continue propping up an already existing infrastructure. Right. That's a great observation, Peter. Any others? You can also put it in the chat. Um, but to kind of go off of what Peter is saying and feel free folks to um, jump in is, you know, as you are kind of earlier, what I said, like the tool of education um, has, has heavily been used. And in this case also um, used to not just spread um, initially it was to spread, you know, Christianity, but in this particular 
era, the U.S. was using education to spread the U.S. democracy. Um, and so similarly in the Philippines, they very much um, felt like they needed to export American democracy through education systems, not just on the elementary, you know, middle school or high school levels, but at the college level. And so there were actually a lot of opportunities for Filipinos, uh, Filipinx people to um, be trained to become a nurse. And um, a lot, all, almost all the courses were, were taught in English. Um, and then you know, in 1948, to combat Soviet propaganda during the Cold War, um, the exchange visitor program was actually created in 1948. And that was just two years after the Philippines gained independence from the U.S. And um, this program was created, which allowed foreign professionals to come to the U.S. for two years to help kind of um, spread, like to, to essentially like say, hey, look at um, the U.S. and like what a great kind of society we have, um, why would you want to believe in the Soviet and kind of their propaganda? Um, so as a result of kind of the schools that were opened up, uh, many Filipino nurses were already trained in kind of American style nursing. And so the exchange program in 1948 actually allowed for a lot of them to come over very easily and kind of transition um, seem pretty seamlessly. And then similarly, the kind of one of the immigration acts, um, immigration and nationality acts in 1965 also allowed a larger number of immigrants from around the world, not just the Philippines to come. Um, and I think it, it particularly privileged um, particular um, immigrants of a certain class, right, who had professional degrees or some kind of professional background, um, whereas it kind of left others, uh, other immigrants uh, at a disadvantage. Um, and, you know, so I think it's interesting to see that the particular ad, the 1969 one, um, was actually public was to publicize these jobs as kind of like a form of travel and adventure. Uh, but it was really because the U.S. hospitals were um, finding themselves in a critical shortage of nurses following World, World War II. Right. So there was clearly an interest convergence of like, all right, we need nurses. <laughs> Where can we get them from? Let's bring them over. And then it resulted in kind of this like mass transnational migration and also brain drain uh, as a result. And, you know, as a result today, we are seeing that 31.5% uh, of nurses deaths from COVID-19 are Filipino Americans, as a lot of them um, came over right in the 60s or the 40s. Um, and they're now in the vulnerable age of, you know, 60 something and above and they're nurses on the front lines. So clearly their exposure, you know, and their risk is like much higher and no one is talking about it whatsoever except the Filipinx community. And we're actually in the middle of Filipino American Heritage Month right now in October. So we figure it would be fitting to just kind of name some of these pieces of history as well. Um, but, you know, to speak to 1965 and how the Immigration Act only privileged certain people, um, Min, do you want to click? Yeah, I really wanted to highlight um, kind of this phenomenon of like Chinese laundries, right? So this image is actually of um, men who uh, many were single because the Exclusion Act didn't allow them to kind of bring their families with them. So a lot of them would work in these Chinese laundry um, shops that were set up um, because it was a form of kind of business that required no special skills, it required no venture capital, it didn't actually require them to speak any English. Um, and, and white men often consider this kind of work really undesirable. Um, and so a lot of Chinese men ended up turning to laundry work because they were prevented to, to work from other more lucrative services, um, like mining and fishing and farming and manufacturing. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, they were allowed to kind of open all these Chinese laundry shops because it really posed no threat to kind of the white status quo. Um, and I think, you know, may, I hope you can reflect a little bit about, you know, what other occupations and industries do you find yourself thinking about like, oh, why is it so dominated by a certain, you know, Asian American population? Um, and it's often, it's not due to ge genetic predispositions, like, oh, Chinese men are just better at washing clothes, right? It's often um, very much, or Filipinos are just better nurses, like there's no such thing, um, even though that's probably what, um, you know, and propaganda back in the day, and maybe even now, is, is still trying to have you think like, um, Indians make really good tech CEOs, you know, like there is, there's no such thing. Um, all those are, 
are really just like ways of racializing people and really hiding the kind of historical um, impacts of kind of inclusionary and exclusionary practices that only that you know kind of what is gatekeep right who gets to be um, leaders in certain industries and who doesn't um, and I think while we might think oh yeah Chinese laundries aren't a thing anymore yes because they were replaced by washing machines um, and so how does automation also kind of remove and displace certain populations um, why is it that we have a lot of restaurants that you know like Chinese restaurants for example during COVID how do they fare um, how, how are we thinking about nail salons and, and why is it that you know, so many, Viet how did so many Vietnamese uh, Americans end up in the nails kind of in industry? So there's a lot of other forces um, that are kind of at work, right? Um, behind the scenes um, and not really in the forefront of people's consciousness. Um, rather it's made to, to be, it's portrayed to be kind of like a, the best that you can do because of, of where you came from. Um, and so, you know, Orientalism and the ways in which like um, Asian Americans continue to be kind of um, fashioned in, in c the conscious mind is, is just everywhere, right? Like this image of Abercrombie and, of Abercrombie and Fitch t-shirt was actually created in the 2000s, the early 2000s. Um, so, you know, while Chinese laundries don't exist, somehow, you know, caricatures like these still do. Um, and, and we're still made to be, you know, like Asian men are still made to be seen as like less manly um, and just always the butt of a joke. So thinking about how is it that all these kind of popular cultural references still continue to per pervade um, our, our culture today and how does that then normalize when we exclude people on the basis of race? How does that allow other people to, to be on board with um, you know, completely removing someone based on the basis of their race or religion or just, you know, appearance. Um, and so I think this next slide is to kind of just um, have you all think about, um, you know, ways in which anti-Blackness um, continues to, to show up in Asian American um, communities. Um, and so does anyone recognize the image on the, the far left? And Min, if you want to just go back so that they can just look at one um, image at a time. Yeah. So anyone know like where that's from or have seen it in like, yeah, Peter. Wasn't that from the 90s LA riots? Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that is correct. Good job, Peter. <laughs> um, that is actually an image, and there were many like them, um, of Korean Americans who would kind of sit on rooftops to with their guns to defend their properties, um, a lot of which were destroyed in the LA riots in 1992 um, as a result of, you know, Ronnie King's um, murderers not being held accountable. Um, and the rage that ensued. And so these images were often propped up as kind of heroic um, because, you know, they were like, look at them kind of using their American rights to own guns to defend property. And not once or rarely were there uh, conversations about Black life that was taken as a result of, you know, wanting to def defend these properties. And not to say that Asian American life was not important because there were certainly Asian Americans who were injured as well. Um, but the larger conversation should have been about where were, you know, where were kind of government forces in, in kind of attending to quote unquote justice, right? Um, and the justice system was clearly broken. And so that resulted in just a lot of, of violence and tension um, and brokenness, and how how is it that you know Asian Americans have have we reckoned with like our own complicity in taking Black life, um, not just in the 1992 LA riots, but how has that idea of, of property being more valuable than Black life continued to kind of follow us? Um, and then another image, um, what do y'all do? Y'all remember this one? 
you can also pop it in the chat. Um, so it's actually a photo of um, individuals who were protesting on behalf of an officer named Peter Liang. Um, so Karen might know this because, you know, she's from New York City. Uh, but yeah, this police officer in New York uh, essentially took the life of Akai Gurley um, because they misfired. Um, and nevertheless, you know, the officer was held accountable. But what was interesting was when the Asian American community showed up to say that his actions were just a tragedy and to not make him a scapegoat. Um, and to just, you know, let him be completely acquitted um, and that he, he should not be, you know, made an example um, just because he was Asian. And I think, you know, there were definitely, it was definitely an interesting kind of juxtaposition of like, you know, yes, we want to hold the police accountable, but because he's Asian, then he shouldn't, he should be held to a different standard, essentially, was what uh, folks were asking. Um, and how justice, you know, like what is justice? And then that also makes us think about kind of like the affirmative action um, rhetoric that's happening right now, right? And where th this poster essentially is, is saying, I have a dream too. Um, taking words from MLK, I have a dream speech. And, you know, just how, how folks are kind of weaponizing laws or, or arguments um, that, that black activists um, and organizers have put forth um, but in a way that really only benefits us right so is this justice or just us um, as dr oyan poon would say um, and then there's another article uh, uh, image where you'll see this is actually a text message um, screenshot between um, fraternity brother brothers um, at the nyu fraternity and it was um, during kind of the summer when you know George Floyd's murder and everything um, went down, um, Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and the string of kind of uh, murders by um, police officers, and just the back and forth, right, um, really shows you know one would assume oh well they're at NYU so they should be educated or you know have be have more exposure to black communities uh, or black people um, whether it's at the university or in the city yet the you know understanding of, of black people is still so limited um to these kind of racial tropes um and, and what does it take right for 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 us to really unlearn that um when you know asian american fraternities were created to build camaraderie um but are we building camaraderie around a really negative thing um and needless to say, the, the fraternity was suspended, but what, what are we learning? What kind of conversations are we having with, within our own community um, to really call out problematic ideas of who deserves to live, which is really a basic right. Um, and I think other ways in which anti-Blackness shows up, it's, it's certainly not a, uh, the examples I've given are very US-based context, but colorism is actually you know, one that cuts across globally. Um, and not to say that any of these examples don't apply globally, they, sh they certainly do. But the picture of Fair and Lovely, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that brand. I know I grew up with it, uh, with advertisements every day where Fair and Lovely uh, was, was what was kind of pushed to, especially to the South Asian community or the, you know, anyone who's darker skin, any brown person essentially, um, literally the box shows that a darker person to a lighter person is, is kind of the goal. And so colorism shows up in a lot of ugly ways um, and continues to pervade our community. And it, it really, you know, continues to justify a lot of anti-blackness within our communities. And I think it has showed, shown up in, in really horrific ways uh, presently with the genocide of like the Rohingya population, which is that last image um, that is appearing. Um, and so we think about how is it that like Islamophobia is also rooted in anti-Blackness. Um, and so we just want you to think more expansively about, you know, how, how these um, forces and the term anti-Blackness shows up. Yeah, um, and then 
you know, however, during like this period of inclusion, um, we also wanted to highlight how there are numerous instances of Asians and Asian Americans working alongside other people of color um, against these narratives of U.S. imperialism, as well as liberal democracy and really interrogating anti-Blackness within the community. Um, the first example, you know, on the left is a photograph from the Third World Liberation Front, which was a coalition of Black, Latinx, Native, and Asian students who were who, who, who collectivized at San Francisco State University in 1968 in order to run one of like the longest student strikes in U.S. history. Um, you know, these strikes called for numerous things, including you know internal university reform that entailed hiring more faculty of color and like creating an ethnic studies curriculum. But you know, in addition to like internal change in the university, the Third World Liberation Front also fought for the demilitarization um, of the U.S. and civil rights by calling for the end of the Vietnam War. Sorry, I just sneeze. <laughs> um, and then in the middle is Richard Aoki, who was a member of the Black Panther Party and the Socialist Workers Party, and he held a leadership position as a field marshal in the, in the Black Panther Party and has done work alongside Black revolutionaries who created communal anti-imperial spaces for all third world people. Um, you know, at the same time, um, uh, after Aoki's death, people learned that he was formerly um, an, an informant with the FBI, um, you know, who under the government technically would serve as a spy sort of to keep track on black radicals, especially during that period. You know, but in light of this information, some people, including former Panthers, have either you know, critiqued Aoki heavily or have dismissed those claims, saying that his work was genuine and transformative regardless of that formal affiliation. And, you know, and bringing up this fact, I, you know, like, I, we don't mean to like, either discredit him nor absolve him either, but rather like, to serve as a reminder for us to keep accountable those who we idolize or you know, remember in history as, you know, and we should always remember that people are always flawed, even those who we um, you know, celebrate. Um, and this applies to Grace Lee Boggs in the bottom right, um, who's uh, sitting alongside uh, James, Bogg, her, James Boggs, her spouse, you know, who we learned yesterday um, in, the, in the documentary that she was also a flawed character and a flawed organizer in terms of her like impenetrability and her sort of like stoic exterior and like not being able to connect with others. Um, and Grace Lee Boggs, as you all know, was an incredible revolutionary who combined academia with community organizing and did a lot of youth empowerment work um, with youth of color in Detroit. Um, lastly, in this top corner, we have Yuri Kochiyama, who was a very close friend and a co-conspirator with Malcolm X. And all throughout her work, she led protests, created a radical news service, which she hand delivered to folks in Harlem. She opened up her space, like her home for political prisoners, where even her living room was the space where the Black Panthers met for their meetings and is actually where they drafted their, a, a version of their 10 point program. Yep, and you know, I think we would be remiss to not mention that the origins of the term Asian American um, really came about in the 1960s. No, it's not accidental that it was happening, um, you know, kind of during the civil rights movement. Um, and it was coined, specific, or it was, yeah, recordedly coined by Yuji Ishioka and Emma G uh, in the photo that you see above on the right corner um, and yeah I think they were really inspired by the black power movement and the need for Asian American born communities who um, had historically fought for their claim to citizenship and um, I think prior you know it was on the UC Berkeley's campus where this term was coined and, and first used um, and it was really conceived as a way to lay claim of being American while also honoring um, our difference from whiteness. And prior to the 1960s, Asian Americans really only just identified with their kind of family's ancestral origins. Um, so the term really signaled kind of a shared and interconnected history of immigration, labor exploitation and racism, as well as a common political agenda. Um, it was a way of, of kind of pushing back against the pejorative word of Oriental. Um, and I think it's really oftentimes what gets lost is the fact that that this is a political identity, it really often gets reduced into a biological one um, or a phenotypical one. You know, we don't often, when we say Asian Americans, we, in the US context, we often think of like East Asian presenting folks, um, but that is certainly not the case, right? Um, so just want you all to kind of think about, you know, where where is the po politics of Asian America today? 
um, and how are we can how are we shaping it as as people as part of this community? Yeah, um, and we're running out of time, so we're, Dean, you're not going to try to streamline some information. But as Dean, you said, the formation of Asian American as a term allowed for you know, social and political collectivity um, for Asian people, you know, whereas before we had the term Oriental or Kuli, or in 1966, the term model minority, in 1968 with this term um, Asian American, it sort of served as a reclamation of political identity and thus sort of emerged the, the movement of yellow power, um, which was really frequent in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and it's important to note that yellow power, as it's coined here by Amy Uyumatsu, you know, grew from black power, which also became a nexus that inspired red power, for Native peoples um, and brown power for Latinx populations. Um, and I think it's important to note that all of these movements of, you know, black, yellow, red, and brown power um, what, weren't meant to like separate groups of people of color, but, you know, to simultaneously one, recognize the importance of understanding our distinct histories, cultures, and identities, while two, working together with an awareness of these differences in order to build a world that's more inhabitable for everyone. Um, and yeah, and, and, you know, and during this movement of organizing and, and grassroots organizing and resistance in the, in the later 20th century, there were radical movements happening everywhere. You know, like in addition to California, there was stuff happening at Yale. So we wanted to take some time to highlight some Yale history as well. Um, so in New Haven, the, or specifically at Yale, the Asian American Student Alliance was created in 1969 and was in tandem with a lot of organizing happening by Black and Latinx students on campus. Um, specifically with the Black Panther trials, students got, you know, got the Yale administration to completely end classes and put a moratorium on, on grades in order to support local Black Panthers of the New Haven chapter while also uh, protesting for the Vietnam War. You know, and all of this work, formed a sort of third world coalition between all of the student groups that listed on the, the slide who worked together to make Yale a more inhabitable place for students of color, um, forming, forming things such as like the Floating Counselors Program, which we know now as the Peer Liaisons. Um, and eventually like this, this sort of like coalitional work produced a movement for acquiring on-campus spaces for students of color. And at the beginning it was the Crown Street space, space which was an inter-ethnic center between Chicano, Asian American, and Native American students. And eventually every, every ethnic group worked together to protest university administration for the formation and institutionalization of each of the cultural centers. Um, all of the dates are listed at the bottom. Um, let's see, we're going to skip through that. Um, sorry. I'm just going to go through my notes. Yeah, and I, I think these are just sort of as we as we talk about like solidarity and resistance and organizing, we wanted to draw some of these 1970s or 80s examples into the contemporary moment. Um, and these are just a few. Um, on the left, we have um, Hmong Americans and Hmong um, people at the state capitol this summer protesting the death of George Floyd. Um, and I, I think the this was a, a direct response to the fact that um, Tao Tao um, was the former officer who was a sort of bystander um, during Floyd's murder and who, who identifies as a Hmong American. So this was a sort of, you know, explicit call for solidarity. Um, at the bottom, we have Nya Vong Sandoval, who is a Vietnamese refugee and was protesting the appointment of Tony Pham, who, was a, who is a refugee who was just appointed as the new ICE director. Um, at the at the top, we have um, a protest for the three point eight billion dollar Dakota Access Pipeline, which runs across North Dakota to Illinois, and it, it, it's in solidarity with the Standing Rock um, So Tribe, um, as you know, as a because of the pipeline overtaking uh, Native lands. And then on the on the right side, we have uh, an Asian man holding a sign in nineteen sixty nine uh, during a rally in Oakland with Huey Newton, who co-founded the Black Panther Party. Um, and then the bottom right, we have a contemporary update or like a graphic uh, of the same of the same slogan of yellow peril supports black power. And that was made during BLM this summer. Um, and, you know, and then like drawing these examples, we wanted to highlight how solidarity and history are being, you know, not replicated across the timeline, but in fact, we produced and reignited in many different ways. Um, and we wanted to end with this, you know, provocative um, example that, you know, makes concrete how Asian American history 
is in shared struggle and connection with other people of color in their histories. And that's um, Fort Sill, which is a United States Army post based in Oklahoma. Um, I, and I got this example from Lisa Lowe, who's one of the professors at Yale in the ERNM and American Studies Department. Um, but to give you a run through, early in early 19th century in Fort Sill, um, black ex-slaves known as Buffalo Soldiers who were recruited during the Civil War were sort of enlisted to construct Fort Sill and its like architecture. And then mid 19th century, Fort Sill evolved into a Native American boarding school, which were these, you know, federal schools that were made to, you know, take Native American children from their families, to assimilate them into white culture, to really indoctrinate English, um, to make them forget names and like learn American education, white American education. And then in the 20th century, it was used as a Japanese American internment camp. Um, and then later in the 21st century, a couple years ago, the Trump administration declared that Fort Sill was going to be used as a migrant detention center of Latin X people. Um, and that, that was when you see this picture at the bottom right happening, where you see Black, Native, and Japanese people coming together, together to protest the, the formation of Fort Sill as a migrant detention center. Um, and yeah, and yeah, and I think this is a really awesome contemporary example that shows how you know people have deeper historical consciousnesses that connect us to other people of color and social movements, um, despite being centuries apart. Um, so we see sort of see like a layering of history happening here um, between numerous groups of people of color. So, yeah. Yes, and so we hope that this kind of crash course in history gives you a sense of the importance of kind of knowing our history so that it doesn't seem like things are happening in a vacuum or in a one-off um, sense because a lot of these are interconnected and show up in different ways. Um, so yeah, I think we just threw a lot of information at you. Um, please take about a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 345.